Hello, and welcome to SciShow Talk Show, that day on SciShow, where we talk to interesting people about interesting stuff. Today, we're talking to Scott Mills, professor of wildlife biology at the University of Montana, where you're studying wildlife and the biology of it. Right. Uh, you've brought me some dead animals, which I always appreciate. Yep. I'm, I'm just going to guess by what's on the table and also by the conversations that we've had before. Uh, that You're studying coat color, and specifically animals that change coat color during the winter. Right. To avoid predators. Yep. And yeah. So animals that change color seasonally to uh, maintain camouflage against a big, scary, tooth-filled, fang-filled, claw-filled world. And uh, and this is an interesting thing to study just generally. Yeah. But as we get deeper into this conversation, it turns out that there's a lot of very interesting stuff going on here, especially when it comes to the climate changing yep. and an animal yep. maybe changing color and becoming a nice bright white animal yep. in a world that does not yet have snow on it. Exactly. Because you would think maybe if I was going to design this system that yep. I would say, uh, turn white when it starts to snow. Mm -hmm. right. But that's not how it's controlled. Right. Yeah, because if, if you said turn white when it starts to snow, as we know, anybody that lives in snow country knows, sometimes it might in August turn mm -hmm. snow and then the snow goes away for a month and then it comes back. And so really the way you'd want to design a system is to say turn white when on average the snow comes and stays. Mm -hmm. And then start and then turn brown when on average the snow starts to go away. And so what cue is there in the environment that tends to track that really well? Well, day length. So is that how they do that's it? That's it. Photo period, day and length. How, yep. Can you like put them in a laboratory setting and like trigger their Yep. Oh wow. Yep. Give them different daytimes. Yep. yep. Oh. Exactly. In fact, uh, the uh, people studying weasels about half a century ago figured that out. Uh, a lot of the photoperiod mechanism was actually with weasels. Okay. Yeah. So photoperiod turns out to be an incredibly marvelous uh, timekeeper, and so lots of animals use it. Photoperiod used for migration cues, for hibernation cues, and for coat color cues. And that's just the length of the day. Length of the day. Gets shorter in the fall. It's yeah. gonna, we can say, well, snow's going to be coming soon. Mm -hmm. So the molt, uh, and, it, and it triggers it tri triggers through pineal gland, through the eyes, and then triggers deep in the brain, releases sets of hormones that mm -hmm. turn that turn brown hair white or white hair brown. And, uh, and it's a marvelous cue until you start having the day link stay the same, but now the snow is not showing up. Right. And so that's what leads to what we call phenologic mismatch, timing between these seasonal cues and uh, uh, the, the environmental variables that they're supposed to track. And suddenly you have a white weasel yeah. on a very brown ground. Exactly. Not super safe. Not super safe. Are you studying this in weasels? We are now studying in weasels. Uh, we're studying it now in weasels, Arctic fox in Sweden. Uh, we're studying it in uh, mountain hares in Scotland. And uh, it all started from, I started studying snowshoe hares way back in the 1990s and have studied them continuously uh, since then, have caught 10,000 hares over the years, studying population dynamics. I'm a population ecologist, so mm -hmm. I, I, I use genetic tools and, and uh, lab tools and lots of field studies to understand how animals are affected by things. And so all of the, the coat color stuff arose from studying population dynamics. And then over time, seeing more and more of these mismatched animals, and that's what right. got it all started. Yeah, I mean, when you're studying evolutionary biology, like looking at individuals isn't that interesting. It's it's how these traits are being mm. spread across mm -hmm. the population, mm -hmm. and also how populations interact with each other. Yeah. So one way that you might see this changing is if like suddenly it's really kind of disadvantageous to change color. Right. You have populations that don't change color yeah. start moving north into that. Yep. So. In, in your research, what are you seeing as solutions that, you know, not like intentional solutions, but right. like how is evolution solving this problem? You know, so yeah, I guess to make sure everybody understands what seasonal color change is. So in the summertime, these, these species, there's 21 species that do this worldwide. Three species of weasels, six species of hares, and some other cool things like mm -hmm. lemmings, some lemmings, hamsters, arctic fox. Do owls do this? No. Okay. Ptarmigan do, though. Okay. Ptarmigan so are some the birds that yeah. do. Yep, several species of ptarmigan do. So it's summertime, it's brown, the day length starts to shorten, and as the day length starts to shorten, they start to molt. This one is partially, is mostly molted. For weasels, at the bottom part, the white comes up, so you can see that this one's still just a little bit. And right around this time, of course, uh, again, because the day length tends to track snow, so snow starts coming in. Mm -hmm. And then um, by around here, mid-November, this same animal is now completely white. Except with this bright 
black tail. Just well, that's an, another interesting story about weasels. Um, <laughs> just to distract, that, be like, go for yeah, the tail. That's what it is. Really? Yeah, that's what it is. That's great. Yeah, so that's a whole another cool thing with <laughs> weasels is this is an adaptation for predators, especially aerial predators, to miss because mm -hmm. they'll 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 see the black tail and they'll aim for that and they'll miss it. So imagine I'm studying. These are weasels, but I'm studying hares. Yeah. Uh, years, you know, starting in the late 90s, and the, the number of days of snow on the ground is shortening. So I'm studying these hares, and they turn from brown to white, and they're supposed to be matching the snow, but by golly, they turn all the way white, and there is no snow. Mm -hmm. So then I started looking at these animals and thinking, well, what is this going to happen? So it seems like there's some options here. One is they recognize they're mismatched. And they do something smart to like avoid. Like they change their behavior. You can't change your skin. You can't. You can't. Yeah, change you your can't go color. back. Yeah. Yep. You're white right. now. The hormones have been released. Yeah. And I you're am white. genetically this. I am this for the. Yeah. I'm this until spring phenology comes and, right. sp and the days get longer. Mm -hmm. But if they recognize, oh, <laughs> I am in trouble. I'm mismatched. I have the wrong wardrobe on. Maybe they hide behind brush. Maybe they uh, they they get more attentive to predators yeah. coming. Yeah. Maybe they do something like that. But we don't find any of that in hares. Then the question becomes, well, it seems like then they have a couple of other options. They're either going to just die. And actually, by the way, we have shown that with snowshoe hares using hundreds of radio collars, that animals, and this doesn't surprise you, that animals that are mismatched mm -hmm. are more likely to be killed. Yeah. And we've shown that that's a big enough effect that if nothing changes, then these then, then hares are going to start declining mm -hmm. because the fitness consequence is big. Right. So then the question becomes, how, mi how might they be able to adapt? Well, is there any variation in the population? Yep. Yeah, so there's variation in timing, and there's lots of variation in timing. Some individuals turn earlier and some turn later. Again, that makes sense. Mother Nature has shaped this trait exactly as you would expect, because we know that some years snow comes early and other years snow comes late. And so over time, those that uh, are mm -hmm. white early are selected for when the snow comes early and vice versa. Mm -hmm. The problem though is now we're seeing this rapid push towards less and less snow on the ground. Mm -hmm. So either what you've got to do is evolve the change in the timing. Mm -hmm. So e evolve a different trigger with day length so that you stay brown longer. Well, if you've got the if you, if it's like a bell curve and on the outside of the bell curve there are some that are just changing their fur lengths later, those ones are going to be more successful, yep, and then yep. that bell curve is going to shift. Exactly. So it might be possible to evolve a change in the timing. Yeah. The problem with that, though, is that these same hormones that trigger the coat color molt also have to do with, with reproduction. Mm. They're things like melatonin. Oh, they're wow. things like their reproductive hormones. So especially in the spring, it, the ability to evolve a change in the timing might be constrained mm -hmm. because you can't be shifting the reproduction the same right. way. So here's the cool thing. It turns out that natural selection has done another thing. It has created populations where they turn white in the winter, where everybody turns white in the winter. But in coastal areas, like on the coast of Oregon, coastal Washington, sure. and southern areas, New Mexico, Mexico for some species where there's not much snow, they don't turn white. They so stay there's brown. Just, there's just no Yeah, so now the table is winter. So winter, there's winter white populations, but then there's some that just forego the molt, so they just stay brown. And they're in these areas. They don't have to migrate either. Right. They're in these areas. But here's the super cool thing. There are what we call polymorphic zones where brown, winter brown and winter white live together. Mm -hmm. That's the special sauce for rapid evolutionary change. Mm -hmm. So uh, in these areas, for example, Skykomish, Washington, uh, just east of Seattle, snow comes and goes. Some years it stays white a lot. Other years it doesn't. Mm -hmm. Over... It always has. Mm -hmm. But in those areas, there are both of these morphed together. And what we know from first principles of evolutionary biology is that meaningful evolutionary change happens fastest when there's lots of variability for selection to operate on. Mm -hmm. One thing that we've been thinking a lot about is, well, might we, might we be able to focus conservation on these polymorphic zones as a means of fostering what we call evolutionary rescue? Basically, kind of the idea that like there is going to be big changes maybe much faster changes than than a lot of these populations have experienced in a long time. But evolution has ways of dealing with that. Yeah. And one, we can kind of hopefully rely to some extent on evolution to help those changes along. Are there ways that we can yeah. play a role exactly. in that? Exactly. Yeah, it's a really important it's a really important question because uh, to be sure, I'm not saying evolutionary magic. I'm not right. saying that, gonna, uh, that don't gonna, worry. It's all going to get fixed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no matter what happens, evolution will just fix everything. Global uh, warming is fine. Yeah. It turns yeah. out animals will. 
Right. And so for sure, we have to keep working on uh, reducing what causes global warming. Sure. And, and, and so nothing of this takes away from the need to reduce our carbon footprint. But what this says is that with hard work, we can foster evolutionary rescue. So then you say, well, how do you do that? What do we know for sure are the conditions that evolution operates the fastest? Evolution happens fastest when populations are large mm-hmm. and evolution happens fastest when populations are connected. And so, so you need we, a way to get like your yeah. your brown weasel from yeah. Mexico all the way up to Canada. Well, no, in this case, the, the argument is, is that if you have this, so we call this a cline, right? So this might be coastal Washington. This might be the, the Cascades mm-hmm. of Washington. And this might be eastern Washington or Montana. Right. And so the idea is if you could focus conservation efforts to maintain populations that are large here, then you increase the likelihood that this population will evolve towards winter brown as mm-hmm. the snow gets less and less. And then these winter brown individuals, if you're also maintaining connectivity, may they may not have to move very far, maybe just a matter of a few miles. Mm-hmm. So perfectly within their normal dispersal distance. So we're not talking about putting them in trucks and we're not talking about- You're not, you're um, not doing the work. You're not trying to yeah, like we're just, move weasels yeah. from one place to another. Yeah, and so it's, it's, it's not to say that these kinds of conservation efforts are easy, but um, the point is, is that these kinds of conservation efforts that we've thought about for a long time as a good way to maintain sufficient numbers of animals have another benefit. Right. And that is they have the ability to foster rapid adaptation or evolutionary rescue. And this is, this very obvious and clear when it comes to coat color. Yeah, like it's a right. it's a very clear signal. Yep. You can see yep. it with your eyes. And also there's a very strong negative pressure in being the wrong color exactly. when you're a preyed yep. in individual or, or population. Mm-hmm. But this could also be true. So like if you're looking at like how do we keep large, diverse, connected populations, that could also be true for traits that we don't even see that are negatively impacting the population. Right. Yeah, so maybe it would be something that would have to do with, uh, do you migrate or not? You're a mo- monarch butterfly, mm-hmm. and uh, there's polymorphism in the trait to migrate or not migrate. Well, again, th- those polymorphic areas mm-hmm. that have both those individuals would potentially be hotspots for evolutionary rescue. Mm-hmm. Maybe it would be a genetic variability to confer resistance against certain diseases. Mm-hmm. That might be another example. Yeah, you could have populations that maybe are less good at digesting certain food sources. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and, and so do you keep using this phrase genetic rescue. Um, yeah. The the rescue that's happening is that evolution doing the rescuing yep. or is that humans or are we doing it well, together? So in the way we're talking about it here where we're just, you know, we're focusing on on these polymorphic areas with conservation actions, mm-hmm. all we're doing is providing the conditions which allow evolution to happen. Right. Now, the conversation has already begun. Well, what about putting some of these guys in a truck yep. and, you know, You don't gotta like them. genetically engineer a special weasel. You're just taking the, the genetic variability that exists and bringing it somewhere bringing, where it's needed. So that would be a, another thing you could do. But you just mentioned the third thing you could do, which is find what is the genetic basis of this mm-hmm. trait. Is it a single genetic basis and potentially doing some sort of Right. Biotechnology or genetic engineering to have these weasels become brown. Right. And that's then, not what I'm talking about right now. And right. that's a whole that's another a whole conversation. Other right. But the, and the, the advantage of that, the potential advantage of that is like you get this one trait without all these other warm weather weasel traits. That's right. Maybe yeah. under diseases or something yeah. like that. So the conversation is is happening on that, on the genetic engineering and the what's called assisted migration, which is moving mm-hmm. them in a truck kinds of approaches. But the focus that I'm trying to put on at first is to say, well, let's just consider how we can, I call it fostering or nurturing resilience or nurturing the ability of evolution to make rapid changes. Because I guess another thing that's important to say is that, um, you know, a lot of people, if anybody took biology more than 10 years ago, they probably only learned about evolution when the topic of the fossil record came up. Right, right. And, evolution you know, like the dinosaurs. That happened and then it, like, we yeah. might as well consider today just a snapshot. Exactly. Like it's, it's all yeah. practically the same as it was right. a thousand years ago. Thousand, 10,000, yeah. 100,000, maybe a million years ago. Mm-hmm. But what we found in the last 20 or so years is that really meaningful changes in body types and behaviors can happen over just a handful of generations. Right. So powerful changes in body types can happen under the right conditions, large, connected, mm-hmm. 
with standing genetic variation, standing variation in a trait, evolution can happen fast. Right. And it's almost as if some animals seem more set up for those fast, that fast evolution where, and I don't know if this is just because they're, they're environment is variable and so there's there's going to be mm. uh, variation in the population but I don't know anything on the research on this but it seems that there might be some animals that are just better at changing faster sure and generation time has a has a big right. effect on it yeah, right yeah, yeah. Uh, polar bears are gonna be uh, <laughs> yeah. are gonna uh, you know have a harder gen- time. if you say four to six generations well that might be just four to six years for mm-hmm. hares or weasels yeah. but that's gonna be 30, 50, yeah. 80 years for a, for a bear or something like that. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, so that's a, that's an issue too. Yeah, yep. fascinating. Yeah, This has elements of like every part of biology in it. It's like evolutionary biology. It's conservation yeah. biology. Right. There's a lot going on here. Like what's your practical research going on right now that you're, you're doing? Well, so I love this kind of stuff. I love this sort of crossing discipline. So yeah. we work with climate modelers. We work with people that are working on the transcriptome and the genomic basis mm-hmm. of traits. We do a lot of field work. We are working with people that study vision. We're working with people that do sort of computational models to look at uh, how evolution of predators and prey and sort of evolution of camouflage. Mm-hmm. So right now what I'm doing is putting together teams to try to look at all these parts all at once. So we have a, a sort of a big thriving international group of collaborators where we're we're using all these different disciplines to try to understand this really big important question of mm-hmm. what's the ability of animals to adapt to rapid environmental change. You can't do it within one discipline. You yeah. have to cross all these disciplines. Well, and that's more and more where the most interesting science yeah. is being done. And, and it's uh, very collaborative. It requires that that collaboration. It also requires constantly learning new things, which right. I imagine is, yeah. a, uh, is a challenge, but also very fun. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And this one is, is fun, too, because it's so, it is so charismatic. It's so just visually compelling. Right. But what I love is, is, is to say a picture tells a thousand words. So if you look at this white animal <laughs> on this brown background, but still, it's, it's not as obvious as you might think. Somebody might look at that animal and say, well, it is done for. That yeah. animal is going to be dead. That species is going to go extinct because there's no snow. Yeah. But another person might say, well, that's what natural selection operates on right there. That animal yeah. might die, but that's going to change gene frequencies. And so this is a, it's really a wide open scientific question right. as to what is the scope for evolution to be able to help, help us get species through rapid environmental change. Are you doing any breeding to see how these traits express? How like, you know, you put a winter brown and a winter mm. white and see yep. what their babies do? Yep. We have some captive animals, and I think we're going to be hopefully seeing one here in a little bit. We have oh, some yeah. captive snowshoe hares uh, here uh, uh, near campus, that we a captive facility. And we're using those animals to uh, to just be able to see their behavioral response to being mismatched. Uh, maybe their stress response to being yeah, they mismatched. Get, do they get freaked out? Are they scared all the time when they're mismatched? No. Well, we're just— You don't just, know yet. In the field, we don't see uh, we don't see any signal right. that they have a clue, <laughs> and it always makes me so feel re- bad because people think that these hairs just look really stupid. Because we can walk right up to a hair that's this this oh, uh, this and light, exactly and they the same. they are sitting there like they're camouflaged. And I always just want to. It's like you know, it's the closest a biologist gets to walking in on somebody in the shower, right? You just want to go, can, dude, you are you are so, you so, are so not camouflaged. Right you need to be running. You're a hare. You got big feet. You have strong legs. You should be running. But they don't. They count on their camouflage. Yeah. And that's the case even with all these working. species because all 21 species, even Arctic fox, uh, get eaten by predators. Mm-hmm. And so camouflage is their number one uh, way of staying alive, more so than speed. Even for hares, they count on their camouflage. So in the wild, they seem to be really dumb, which... But they're not dumb. They just there there hasn't been any way right. for for evolution to shape them to have self awareness to uh, to realize that they're mismatched. Right. Yeah. I don't have a yeah. mirror. I don't know what color I am right now. And on average, they're only mismatched a couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, in the fall and the spring. So we have these captive animals and breeding. We could do breeding experiments. We haven't started doing that yet, but uh, we could do some breeding. Uh, but but we are we are making progress and figuring out with collaborators, including uh, Jeff Good and his team here at University of Montana, uh, making progress in um, figuring out the genetic basis of right. this of this trait, mm-hmm. which is pretty cool. And yeah. also, I've heard that uh, hair like reproduction is not friendly. Yes, it's not friendly. <laughs> 
So you yeah. may, you don't necessarily want to take your nice, like you've gotten right. these guys comfortable right. and in their captive yeah. situation and put yeah. them in a stressful, dangerous situation. Yeah, in hares anyway, females are bigger than males and they're not very tolerant. Um, reproduction tends to be pretty violent. So it's, yeah. it's not something we, we want to embark on right away until we really get some more things figured out in the husbandry. But the husbandry is working out great and we we have 17 animals in, in, out in the in the facility, they're they're happy, well cared for. Uh, they actually have lived a lot longer than they would have lived in the wild. Because mm-hmm. the hares in the wild maybe only yeah. live one to three years. These guys have already lived in captivity four years. And are we going to get to see some of them? We we'll talk so. about I how so. charismatic and interesting they are. Yeah. This is Jesse from Animal Owners Montana, bringing us some rabbits. <laughs> Lindsay Barnard, uh, a student at the University of Montana, and heading up husbandry with these hares. So this is one of our snowshoe hares from our Sealy Lake population. She's got a little white left on her. Uh, oh no, we're free. Look <laughs> <laughs> at those big legs. Yep, big legs. That's why they're called snowshoe hares. Their, sho- their feet are like snowshoes. Um, we got normal bunnies too. <laughs> it's just a got garden little, variety fluff Little ball. <laughs> ears and little legs. Look at her go. So you can really see the difference between <laughs> hares and rabbits. So uh, hares oftentimes have these longer ears and bigger feet mm-hmm. than rabbits. But the biggest differences between them are behavioral. Hares are born uh, with their eyes open, uh, typically on the ground, not in burrows, not underground. Uh, mm-hmm. Whereas rabbits tend to be born helpless with eyes closed. Mama they're needs naked. to take care of them. Yeah. yeah. Right. They're naked yeah. and, and mama needs to take care of them. Yep. And so hares are really exposed to predators from the moment they're born. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Whereas rabbits, they and have they a little easier. They don't even build a nest. Do, I That's mean, right. They don't they build a, right use, on there. Sometimes just a little depression or even just right on the grass or right yeah. under a bush or right under a tree. Yeah. They're like a deer that way where it's just yep. like That's right. ready, have to yep. get ready to go. And then mom just comes back and checks on them one to three or four times a day to nurse them. Mm-hmm. And that's wow. pretty much it. Whereas rabbits have it easy. They've got yeah. mama looking after it's them for 20 hard. days. It's <laughs> hard. They, they only come, they have a nest and they're hidden, but they really only visit about three times a day. Uh-huh. But yeah, they yeah. they get three weeks of mom and dad helping them. <laughs> and they're not just like, good luck. All right. Nobody has right. it easy in the wild. <laughs> what she's I, she's from, calmly checking things out. Yeah. You don't, she doesn't seem freaked out. She just seems... uh I want to be independent. Thank you very much. Yes. Like table. <laughs> yeah. Tables are not my favorite. Now, the challenge, Lindsay, is this one doesn't like to go back in the cage, right? So afterwards, yeah. after the filming's done, we might have a challenge on our hand. <laughs> perfectly happy. You, you might long. have a new pet here for the rest of uh, the yeah. rest of your life. <laughs> do you do so? You're in charge of the husbandry for these mm-hmm. guys. They were, they've been in captivity for four years. About uh, three? About three. Three right. years. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so what kinds of like behavioral training do you do with them? Is it just desensitization and hands-off experimenting? Or is it, do you work with any sort of like target training or crate training? No. We don't do any training. We want to keep them as, uh, their behaviors as natural as it would be in the wild. Yeah. Because our experiments are a lot about how they act in the wild. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. yeah, we try to minimize stimuli and minimize how much we're actually in there interacting sure. with them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But then also balancing that with like, you want them totally freaked out by you. Yeah. N- yeah, exactly. We bring them lots of treats and they know that. We bring them fresh branches every week because mm. uh, they love branches. That's their favorite. So. Ooh, branches. We, we sort of have yeah. the leaves or the, the little cambium operation. layer. They eat the needles. They love okay. needles, okay. pine needles, and, and then they'll just eat the bark. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And sometimes in the twigs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Bring in the wintertime. Branch, my favorite. <laughs> like, yeah. like bunny hot the dogs. Because yeah. <laughs> if you think about it, in the wintertime, they're up there on above ground cruising around, and so they mm-hmm. can't just be eating grasses and herbaceous in the it wintertime. It like so pine they needles, needles would be very healthy. Right. <laughs> well, remember. It like, like a lot of, not a lot of nutrition in there. Yeah, remember hares and rabbits have yeah. coprophagy, right? Mm-hmm. So right, they, so they do it two times. They do it yeah. two times. Mm-hmm. They eat mm-hmm. their Get first all round of feces. The out. So they kind of do like a cow does, but a cow has a big old rumen and then it can right. do it just all at once. But a rabbit or hare doesn't have a big enough system to ferment mm-hmm. the bacteria like a rumen. So they do the, the twice. When we say eating. they do it two times, we mean they eat their poop. Right, right. out of their bums. Wait, like, like. I mean, at least rabbits do. I don't know. That's right. Yeah, hares like, yep. do it directly. They like, yeah. they, they have this little. 
nice gooey bunch that they go out and they bend over and they just eat it right out of their bum and then they go right like back to they it. eat their own or yeah. they eat their friends well i mean they would eat their parent like their moms like they that's oh. how they would get the bacteria in their gut in the first place mm-hmm. so they would do, be doing it to their moms to get that but then they do it to themselves the more you know <laughs> where is did your hair go <laughs> She's okay. hanging out by the rabbit crates. <laughs> We're not always great parents. We don't all, always know where they go. <laughs> They're in the area. They can't leave. <laughs> What's the research you're doing with this captive population right now? Yeah, so with this captive population now, we're doing uh, some behavioral trials. So as I mentioned in the wild, we don't have any indication that they know when they're mismatched or that they behave appropriately. But there's a lot of things going on in the wild that are hard to control for in a research project. So in the facility, in the captive environment, we can control everything else. We can do uh, put down, for example, brown tiles and white tiles, and then we can put the hair in there, and then we can say, well, where, what does it choose to match itself appropriately um, just when it's hopping right. around? And then we can simulate a potential predator event uh, like the call of an owl or uh, the smell of a cat or something like that. And Just see, jump out at them. And see. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then see whether at that point do they then do they then behave differently and suddenly start to match themselves. So we can really find out for sure whether there's any ability for them to uh, to deal with being mismatched behaviorally, which would be a big deal if it is. We don't think it is. And, mm-hmm. and without, without that, then it, then they really are going to need to count on evolution to make it through being mismatched. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then we can also look at uh, stress hormones that are released in the feces. And uh, we can oh, okay. we can so see you whether you have to take their blood all the time. You just yep. be like, were you freaked out in the last? I don't know how long it takes for food to go through a rabbit, but yeah. that long. Right, and then you just look at their pellets and then you just ask whether there's stress hormones yeah. in there. Is there any urine collection either? Is there any way that that could? It could, but it's just harder to collect that. Sure. Have right? to make them wear diapers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> or put yeah. a pan underneath. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. I think that making them wear a diaper would be easier than that. You see you that? Try you, get a, that you try and get a, a diaper on a rabbit. No, it's not my job. That's their job. Sorry, on the hair. <laughs> yeah, I think you can put a diaper on that, but I don't know if you can put a diaper on this one. Uh, we haven't introduced these guys yet. Oh yeah, so we have actual rabbits. These are not <laughs> rabbits, hairs. not hairs. Yeah, yeah. This is uh, Hazel. You have Hazel, and this is Bigwig. And uh, Bigwig is new. Yes, and these guys are not friends yet. Bigwig okay. would like to be friends. Hazel is done. Would like something else. Right. Bigwig's eyes are very big. Um. Yeah, I mean... Is that a fear? It looks like a fear. It, it, it's like, he's super on guard. If he was, like, really scared, he'd be trying to kick out my in my hands right, right now. Um, but, like, his eyes have been like this since we've had him. Look how good he is. He's he just, so like, good. He just sits he's there. so cute. Um, both of these guys were bred to be pets, and then they're both Netherland dwarf rabbits. Uh, he has a little bit smaller ears there. And having that tattoo in there, pretty sure he was, like, bred to be a show rabbit. Both of these guys were people's pets that they didn't want anymore. And so they asked if we would take them in. And unlike hares, rabbits are are very social. And so they'll, you know, create big warrens and uh, live many, many of them together. Um, and so we are we are hoping that these two will will tolerate each other. He's been neutered now, and that usually helps. <laughs> but yeah, these guys they uh, will spend uh, about three weeks um, with their mom. Or, you know, being taken care of, and then by about seven weeks, they're ready to just go on their own. Um, but they're really they don't explore until three weeks, so they got a mm-hmm. whole three week buffer. Whereas to be hairs protected, they just are out born on fuzzy. their own. Yeah, born they're still still about the same time till they get weaned. Mm. Yeah, but, but right. they're still out there. That's These right. guys are they just like come a, back once a, a day in a, yeah. in a little mm-hmm. tiny nest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, and that and it is interesting too, isn't it? The difference in in terms of domestication. I mean, yes. there are no four H. Pet hairs. No. Yeah. There are none. Yeah. yeah. Like, why are hairs so much harder to domesticate? It's it's interesting, just mm-hmm. isn't it? That the, the different species are just have it's different right. inherent uh, mm-hmm. responses, sort of just I'm genetic programming. Social too. Like maybe the more social, social. Is more accepting mm-hmm. of yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, we yeah. don't know. I don't know. That's yeah. a big mystery. It's like how can, how can we can domesticate certain animals? Right. And, yeah. Know. And another key to right. domestication, of course, is being able to breed lots of them. Yes. And so rabbits that are helps. good at that. Mm-hmm. 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 Hairs a little less good. A little less good. Yeah. 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 But um, right, yeah, the yeah. hairs are not social. Rabbits often are, not always, right? But often exactly. they, they do live in these warrens. I mean, these guys warrens. would get better if they had females instead of trying to introduce two oh, males. Yeah. So that would be an, an easier. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How are hares doing these days? 
Uh, you know, they're doing, our, our, from our 20 years studying them, we don't see any sign of big decline, but uh, several people have published that, that they are retracting their range from south to north. Hares, white-tailed jackrabbits, and we can't say for sure at this point, we can't connect that, that that's because of mismatch mm-hmm. mortality from being mismatched. But that's certainly a potential right. that, it's, that it's from being mismatched. And how would you determine that versus like uh, habitat loss? Well, right. So, uh, you know, you could add, you could start and a lot of people are starting to do this and have done it to some extent to ask, is, is the habitat loss just coming from south to north? But doesn't, aren't there cases where it also comes from north yeah. to south? Mm-hmm. And so if you do that, the people that have done that, there doesn't seem to be habitat loss doesn't seem to be a, a good single factor explaining it. Okay. So, you know, we tend to be a little cautious, but it's certainly the range attraction is consistent with uh, declines due to being mismatched. But I also, you know, uh, there's, it's not like hares are endangered or anything right. like that. That's why another reason why I think this thinking about this whole evolutionary rescue thing, it's kind of cool to be thinking about it with species that are not deeply in trouble because you could figure out what to do with species that aren't deeply in trouble and then apply that to species yeah. that are more in trouble that would be harder to study. Right. Mm-hmm. And for clarity, in my head, a jackrabbit looks like a hare. Are they just hairs yeah. from a different yeah. name? Yeah, yeah, this is the this is the problem common with names. common names, right? <laughs> compared to scientific names. So jackrabbits are not rabbits. Jackrabbits are hares. And, so they're and leapers. Where do they're uh, the, jackalopes land? Yeah, yeah, jackalopes. Yeah, jackalopes, jackalopes, yeah they're jackalopes they're, they're up on <laughs> people's walls, I guess. Yeah. 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 One single <laughs> habitat species. Yeah. Walls. A wall. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen them on the floor. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. yeah. A couple on the floor. They're all living. In houses, though. Yeah. <laughs> you are fuzzy. Super fuzzy. I am it's springtime. These covered. guys. Oh, yeah. You're going to want to change that shirt. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah have... <laughs> this one's molting, too. You're going to have a lot of hair Lots hair. Lots of hair everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to I, uh, wanna write a paper that starts with hair hair. It's something. Yeah. You yeah. can figure out yeah. something. H-A-R-E, H-A-I-R. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. We'll get there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you keep working. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So when they're not handleable, how do you safely restrain them? Pillow cases. Mm -hmm. And I'd say 50% of the time, if we need to handle them to do like a physical examination, sometimes we can't fully do the physical examination. We have to just let them go. Yeah. We certainly do a lot in the field when we're handling hares to uh, to keep stress minimum. Yeah. We have protocols of of what to do to um, if, if an animal seems like it's going, uh, being stressed. So we are really aware of that with the wild animals to, yeah. reduce, to reduce any concerns. It's, mm-hmm. Their well-being is the most important thing. If if they seem to be stressed, we let them go. We don't worry about the data. Yeah. We let them go. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I know with rabbits, like when they come in new and they're not used to being handled, like Big Wig is still, still working on him. Mean, he's doing great. But like me picking him up and moving him around, like He'll kick, and you have to hold them in just the right way so they don't yeah. hurt themselves right. trying to get away. Yeah. Are hairs the same, but just mm. a little more extreme because they're more powerful? <laughs> yeah, you know, I think with any wild animal, you need to let them know that they're being held. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, they'll they'll really struggle. Yeah. So when we're training new people, a lot of times the uh, somebody will be very tentative. But if they're very tentative, mm-hmm. then it makes it worse. Yes. Because then the thing thinks it can get away and starts Works thrashing. To and get that's away. when you worry about mm-hmm. getting hurt. Yeah. And so we do a lot of training to say that, you know, you don't want to be too firm, but you don't want to be, uh, you want to be firm enough. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yep. When you're handling it. Jesse, thanks for bringing in a rabbit for me. A uh, two. Two. Well, this one's mine. <laughs> 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 Very soft and warm. Well, you're welcome then. <laughs> um, and thank you guys so much for sharing your research and briefly your hair. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, great, great to be here. Thanks. Yeah. And where can we find out more about your research? Well, uh, website. My website has a whole bunch. Uh, so if you just type Scott Mills University of Montana, you should get it. And uh, we have all kinds of videos and articles and sciencey articles and non-sciencey articles. Sweet. We may even have an interpretive dance on there before long. I mean, good bunny dances. Everybody wants that. <laughs> yeah, it's coming soon. <laughs> Thank you all for watching. This has been SciShow Talk Show. If you want to follow us, get more stuff, go to youtube.com slash SciShow and subscribe.